can be seated. Amen. Thank you very much, worship team and congregation for great singing. Really good, really good singing. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, and my message this morning, the title of it anyway, is, is a question, what ship do you sail in? What ship do you sail in? After Easter, we're going to be looking for eight weeks at the life of Joseph. You know, Joseph, in the book of Genesis, in the Old Testament, he is the most talked about, most written about person in the book of Genesis, and he is really a type of Christ. There's so much in his life that parallel the life of Jesus Christ. We're going to be looking at Joseph right, starting right after Easter. There's going to be connect groups and all of that, that we will focus on the life of of Joseph. And then after that, we're going to be looking and working in the summer through 1 Corinthians and looking at some uh, ancient uh, or some ancient wisdom to apply to present day situations and problems. So we welcome you and just invite you to join us for all of those services. Now, the question is this Is being a Christian more like being a tourist on a cruise ship or a Marine serving on a battleship? And this is a fundamental question I was thinking about this week, kind of came up with it. It determines our whole outlook on what it means to be on this Christian journey in following Jesus Christ. So let's consider these two, two options that we have. Which, which option? I'm not asking you which option you'd rather have, but which kind of Christian are you? If a Christian is a tourist on a cruise ship, the primary purpose of their journey in following Jesus is to have their needs met. Cruise ships have large buffets. In fact, the cruise ship here is the largest cruise ship at this point in the world. It's called the Allure of the Seas. And uh, they just don't have decks. They call their decks neighborhoods. And they have seven neighborhoods. So when you sign up for a cruise on that ship, Seven neighborhoods. That's crazy, isn't it? That's huge. And they do have a picture of that uh, in comparison to uh, the Titanic. I, I don't know if you feel comfortable on a ship uh, compared to and up beside the Titanic, but this one makes the, look ta the Titanic look really small, really small. Seven neighborhoods, 25 dining options. And I was thinking of Kingsville, and, I mean, the whole town here in Kingsville, we don't have 25 dining options in Kingsville. Uh, or probably Kingsville, Leamington put together, we'd be, we'd be trying harder to find 25 dining options. I suppose maybe if we included Le Leamington, we might. And there is 2,385 crew members to serve the crew of over 6,000 people. And so you can go to large buffets. How many have been on a cruise? You know what I'm talking about. Okay, there's a few of you. If you ever get a chance to go, go on a cruise. My wife kind of dragged me on the cruise. I did not want to go. I thought it was going to be the worst week of my life. I, I, all I pictured was, was I would be hanging over the side, throwing up for a week. And, there, you know, the captain, I, I mean, I had this picture. It was a mental picture of some guy with, uh, with a beard and one eye. And, and at one leg, and a, a parrot on his shoulder, and, you, you know, he goes, hey, boy, not used to the sea, you know. I, I mean, that was my idea of this is what I got for a boy. It's not like that at all. It's like being in a hotel and waking up in a new city every, every night, every, every morning. And they, they specialize. 24-hour, large buffets, 24-hour specialized food stations, lounges, bars throughout the ship, a casino, a spa, several pools, a deck you can go on if you don't want to wear clothes. I didn't go on that deck. I just wanted to make that clear. But they have a deck there secluded somewhere in, in the boat. Uh, Broadway shows, all manner of entertainment. And so cruise ship Christians believe that Christianity in the church is really a place for the believing, for the believing to worship and grow and to be, to be fed. A number of years ago, I had a lady call me um, who, who I knew from, uh, from London. She, actually, she was so distraught, she came down to see me. And she was, what she was distraught about 
was that her church <clears throat> was doing this study that uh, called the Purpose Driven Life. <laughs> Remember that? She, she was distraught that her church was doing the Purpose Driven Life, and she had trouble with the first sentence of the first chapter of the first paragraph of that book. She just couldn't get over it, and I'm going to read you that first sentence. Actually, it's a paragraph all on its own. It's very short. It says it's one sentence, and it goes like this. It's not about you. And she was, she, I, now, she loved God. She really did, and she had a lot of faith in Jesus Christ. She, she had it all down there. But she had, she had believed that it was about her. And she said, but pastor, it is about me. It's about me. And she had been taught all of her life in church that it's about you and your needs and you being fed. And so this just being taught in her church sounded like blasphemy. Like, how can this be? This is awful. This is terrible. And, and that's because she was, to her, the Christian journey was on a, on a cruise ship. Uh, it, it was about, for her, it was about being fed and, and ministered to and needs met and entertained and the mission the mission of the church to reach the lost was you can reach the lost that's okay as long as i'm looked after first because it's about me the christian journey is all about me now the, the christian who sees themselves as a marine they have a totally different perspective they serve on a battleship they see the christian journey as being a soldier or serving on a battleship paul uses not the battleship phrase but uh, certainly the soldier phrase and terminology when he talks about serving God. Now, the battleship's sole purpose is to serve its country and to accomplish the mission that has been, it has been commissioned to accomplish. This uh, battleship here is the newest high-tech stealth battleship, the USS Zumwalt. Where do they come up with those names? Zumwalt. Z-U-M-W-A-L-T. Zumwalt. That's maybe the noise it makes when it starts, you know. <laughs> and and, and this, this, uh, this is it's not really a battleship. It's called a destroyer. And it has one purpose, only one purpose. And that is to find and destroy whatever its target is. That's it. That's all it does. And it does it really good because it's stealth. And it can hit targets like thousand miles away and so if you ever have an experience with the Zumwalt it's going to be a bad experience because you're not going to know when it's there and by the time you figure out what happened you're going to be gone anyway that's the way this thing is made and it just has one purpose we're the captain on the cruise ship he has to make sure that the tourists have a great vacation and show up in all the right places and have just a great experience uh, in, in, in food and dining and in entertainment and in all of the different ports to go to. The captain of the Zumwalt, he is com somewhat different. He is focused purely and strictly on the mission. There are no buffets. There are no casinos. There are no swimming pools, Broadway shows, or decks where you can go and lay in the sun with no clothes on. You wouldn't want to do that on the Zumwalt at all. They do have constant drills, though, to keep them ready and able to uh, respond to any of the needs or orders that the captain gives them to fulfill the mission. They do keep fed. It's not called a buffet. It's called a mess hall. And they are fed for the purpose of keeping their strength up and achieving the mission and winning the next engagement. So we have these two images zumwalt battleship or destroyer mission oriented and cruise ship and the question is which journey are you on which ship are you sailing in the christian who sees the journey as being the cruise ship is not focused on achieving a mission but wants their needs met they want to be fed i know when i went on the ship i wanted to be fed and i think i gained about 10 pounds on that one trip they want to be fed, they want to be fellowshipped and filled, and, and they want to have a nice journey of experiences. The Christian who sees their journey as a Marine or a soldier is focused on mobilization and achieving the mission of bringing people to Jesus Christ. Now, what church do you think Jesus is building? That's a big question today, isn't it? Which church is it that Jesus is building? Which church, which ship do you think Jesus is at the helm of as captain and Jesus is going to actually answer 
these questions for us. In Matthew chapter 16, very familiar verse of Scripture. And the first question we have here is, who is your master? Who's the captain? Jesus chapter 16, verse 15 to 17 says this. He says, what about you? And I, I pause there and because I take that personally. He's asking you and he's asking me a personal question. What about you? So, well, what about you? <laughs> he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, of son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father who is in heaven. And so Jesus says to us today, in, a, in phrases it as a question, so what do you think? What do you think? Who am I? What am I all about? And he says that, and in a very real sense, we have to answer that question in our own lives. Who is Jesus Christ? Barclay writes this. He says, Christianity never consisted, consists in knowing about Jesus. It always consists in knowing Jesus. Jesus demands from you and me a personal verdict. Who do you say that I am? And so Peter steps forward. And he answers Jesus, and he says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, Messiah is the word that we call, we use for Christ, and that means the anointed one, the anointed one. Peter says, Jesus, you're the one who's anointed. And in the Jewish understanding of the word Messiah, what Peter would have meant when he said, Jesus, you are the Messiah, he would have understood that word as to mean that Jesus was a person who came directly from God to lead the Jewish nation to victory over its enemies. There's none of this touchy, feel-good stuff in the idea of the Messiah. Now understand that. The Messiah comes as a warrior. He does not come as a whatever. He comes simply as a warrior who leads his people to victory and sets up his kingdom on earth, and that kingdom has no end at all. It re he reigns forever and ever and ever. That's the Jewish Old Testament understanding of who the Messiah is. And Peter says, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. You're the one who is anointed to come, lead your people to victory over their enemies, and set up the kingdom of God on earth and reign forever and ever and ever. He was seen as restoring the power and the greatness of David's kingdom. King David was, a long time ago, he was the greatest king of Israel. And at that point, at the pinnacle of David's reign, the most powerful nation on earth. That's what they were looking for. Rule all of the earth. There would be no end to his righteousness and justice, and he would govern the hearts and the minds of all of humanity. And here's what Jesus says. Jesus says to Peter, he says this, Peter, this truth about me being the Messiah, it did not come to you naturally. It did not come from you watching me. It came to you because the Father revealed to you who I am. The Father in heaven shared that revelation with you. And see, for you and I, knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior comes from heaven, comes from the heavenly father. Now your parents, I, I hope that your parents helped and taught you about God. Certainly the church helps and we proclaim the gospel message. That's our mission to proclaim the message that Jesus Christ died and rose again. That's, that's how we see our purpose here. But in all reality, it comes from the father. God reveals to you and me the truth of Jesus Christ. It's not worldly knowledge, but it's rather God leads a person in their mind and in their hearts to understand who Jesus is. Jesus said this in John chapter 6, verse 44. He says this, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And so Peter is being drawn 
In the same way I was drawn. In the same way you have been drawn. And maybe today you're outside of salvation, but you're here today and you're here because God is drawing you. And he wants you to do, he wants you to make a verdict today on Jesus, on whether or not he is going to be your captain, your master, the one who you follow. So we're told right off, our purpose in life, our purpose on this journey of being a Christian is to follow the captain, that it is all about the captain, the Messiah, the Lord. It's all about him. So that's our first question answered. Another question then is this, what is the mission? What is the mission? And here Jesus says in verse six, uh, chapter 16, verse 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. And so we get this whole idea Jesus is bringing out. You said, I'm the Messiah. You're right. I'm building my kingdom. I'm building my church in this world. And there's a conflict. There is a conflict in this world between good and evil, between righteousness and sin. And the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, the power of the enemy, the power of Satan is not going to overcome the kingdom that I am building. So he goes right to that whole conflict and kingdom thing, because that's how it's understood, the Messiah. The Messiah is leading a conflict. He is building a kingdom, and he's setting that kingdom up on earth forever. That's how they understood it. That's how Jesus understood it. Now, Jesus is using a play on words. He says, and I, I kind of put it down, and I put some pictures there for us to kind of make a comparison. He says, you are Petros, Peter. You are Petros. And Petros, let's go to the next slide. Petros is a small boulder or a, a small rock, which is on the left. That is a Petros. That's what he calls Peter. Peter, you're this small, you're a rock, Peter. I mean, for you to see that and understand and to be brave enough and courageous enough to step out amongst all your peers and declare that I'm the Messiah, you're a rock, man. You are solid. You've got it together. Your faith is solid. You're Petros. And I'm, from now on, I'm going to call you Peter. See, his name was Simon. Now I'm going to call you Peter. You're a small rock. But then he goes on to say, and upon this Petra, Petra isn't a small rock. Rather, it's a large rock rising up from out of the earth, like a huge cliff. In fact, this picture, this is an amazing site in Jordan, and they actually call it Petra because it is a huge rock face rising out of the earth. And what they did, which is absolutely fantastic, is they chiseled that in the ancient days, they chiseled that into that city, into the rock. They didn't carry rocks to be there, but rather what you're looking at there was chiseled right into the cliff face. And they call that a Petra, a huge, big, giant, mountainous rock rising up out of the earth. That's what Jesus, that's what Jesus says. And he says, it's upon this Petra, this big rock here, not this rock over here, but this big one, I will build my church. I'll build my church on that rock right there. Now, now Jesus calls Simon Peter, which means small rock or boulder. You can see it there. And it's as if Jesus is saying to Simon, he's saying this, you're the first person on earth to really recognize who I am. So you are the first stone in the wall of the church that I'm building. You're part of the foundation. And through all of the ages, every person who recognizes me as Jesus, as Christ, is another stone in that wall. You and I are stones in that wall, in the same wall that Peter is built into. That's you and me. In fact, Peter recognizes this, 
And he says, you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. If you need a reference for that, it's 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. So we become, God is building his church, and Peter was that first rock, that first boulder. But you and I also, when we confess Christ as our Lord, when we make him our, our Messiah, our King, our Captain, we become a part of that wall too, that kingdom that he is building. Now, the solid walk Petra is the truth that Peter confesses. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, we don't have time to go into it and read it, but Peter didn't understand himself as being that foundation stone. He understood that was Jesus. And in Peter chapter 2, verse 4, he says, Jesus is the living stone that everything is built on. So if we ask Peter, Peter, who was the big rock? Was it you? Peter says, no, it wasn't me. I'm just the first built boulder in the building, but the building is built on the big stone, the living rock, and it holds everything up together. So the church that Jesus is building, when he uses the word church, he's not talking about denominations. It has nothing to do with denominations. It hasn't got to do anything with what your brand is whether you're a Baptist brand or a Pentecostal brand or a Catholic brand or a United brand or an Anglican, it doesn't matter. He's not talking about that at all. And he's not talking about your building. He's not talking about buildings made of stones or bricks or wood or, or crystal cathedrals or outdoor uh, theaters or outdoor gathering places or if you go to Haiti, little mud huts. He's not talking about that either. What Jesus is talking about is a group of people who've been drawn by God to follow Jesus in fulfilling the mission, in sailing with him on his ship, which he captains on a mission. You're a part of the church that Jesus is building and has a plan and a place and a purpose for your life. There is this conflict we enter when we become Christians. Does anybody ever think that you didn't enter a conflict? When you became a Christian? How many know there's a conflict that you had when you became a Christian? Man, I got hit with a square in the face. Right away. Right away. The gates of hell, in other words, the power of the enemy, try to avail against Christ's kingdom. And that means that it's coming against you and me. Jesus said that his church, though, will not be defeated. It's like a fortress that's built on a huge hill on a rock. And that the church of Christ... Jesus is that foundation. And I believe that it is the church that holds out hope for the world. I don't think it's going to come from governments, folks. I don't think it's going to come from politics. I don't, certainly don't think it's going to come from a military. I don't think it's going to come from education. I think it's going to come from people connecting their lives to God and finding out that God is real and that he is active and that he is present and that he can be in their lives and they can, he, they, he will lead them and follow them. In the church, we have a mission. The Bible just outlines that. I'll give you some of the things that the Bible says you and I are. It says that we are the light of the world. In other words, we talk about the truth, the truth about God and the gospel. In a world full of fake news, half-truth, and outright lies, we're the light that proclaims and holds up the truth that there is God. There is, God is real. Jesus is coming. He is going to establish his kingdom. He is alive and present today in F, each and every one of those living stones that are placed in his church. We're the light. We're the salt to those for whom life has lost its taste. We can tell them you can taste life again in full flavor because of God. We're a family to those who are orphans. That's who we are. We're a new creation for those who have need a fresh start or another chance. That's what we hold out. We're an army to stand against evil and injustice in our world. And we're fishers of men to attract people to come and know Jesus Christ. That's who we are. I read a testimony this week about a gal by the name of Emma Vinson. Vincent, sorry, Emma Vinson. She's a young lady who attended University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Her motto for life was this. 
Smile, they're watching. That's how she lived her life. Smile, they're watching. So she said on the outside, she looked happy and cheerful, successful and bright. And yet she said on the inside, she experienced lust, emotional chaos, pride and fear. Her greatest fear was being found out. That if people really knew me, really knew what I liked, really knew what was going on in my head, they wouldn't like me. They wouldn't like me at all. And so smile, they're watching. She said, I was always trying to gain the approval of other people. I felt that God would never accept me. So I live with a burden of guilt and a masking smile in my life. You know, there's a lot of people that live like that. On the outside, they look pretty good. On the inside, there's all this, this turmoil and chaos and tension in their lives. This is a church. Do you have an answer for her? Well, somebody did. She was invited to a Bible study. The verse of Scripture was from 2 Corinthians 5.21. It said this. This is from the Living Bible. She said, all my bright and shining acts didn't earn God's love. God loved me before I had a trance to try to earn it. And when she realized the truth, again, not a half-truth, but the full truth, that God loves her just the way that she is. That's why we put Easter, our Easter presentation, it's just come as you are. Without pretense, without anything, just come as you are. Because before you were good-looking, <laughs> Before you, you had it all together, God loved you, and he loves you just the same then as he does today. So just come as you are. That's the way God wants to meet you, the real, the, the real you. She says, I watched God deliver me in a very mighty way and learned that his grace could handle all of me. <laughs> you know what? God's grace can handle all of you. Your parents may not be able to handle all of you. Your pastor may not be able to handle all of you all of the time, but God can, and that's good news. Emma today shares her testimony and her life with others to show them how through Jesus Christ they're accepted and can become a new creation. See, that's sailing on Jesus' ship. That's what it's all about. That's following the captain in his mission. Here is where you decide if you're going to be a tourist or a soldier. If your Christian journey is spent on a cruise ship or a battleship. If following Christ is about you or if, if it's about Christ. And I put a little, I put a little um, chart here uh, as I thought through some of the differences and compared them. When following Jesus is all about me, I'm a consumer. I'm looking for, I'm looking for a product that will meet my needs, my religious needs. And it comes with music and bumper stickers and and, and personalities and celebrities. But when I'm following Jesus, and if it's all about Christ, then I'm a servant of him. And I'm focused on the mission that he is on. I'm doing what he's doing. Not what I want to do. I'm doing what he's doing. When it's all about me, I ask the question, what is God doing for me? What, is God, what does God do for me? But when it's all about Christ, what can I do for God? So this is where my la this lady that came to see me, this is where she had to struggle. Because she liked the column where it's all about her. And she was being told for the first time in her life, it's not about you, it's about him. And she struggled with this, man. She struggled with this. When it's all about me, it's how can I get fed? When it's all about Christ, it's how can I use what I have to reach people who don't know Jesus? See, there's a big difference, isn't there? When it's all about me, it's how can I get more intense experiences in the presence of Christ? When it's all about him, it's how do I bring his presence, the presence of Jesus, into the lost world? There's a big difference. And I believe we have to answer that question. Not only who is Jesus, but what's the mission? And am I sailing on the right ship here today? Are you called to prevail? You and I are called to prevail against Christ's enemy. Whether or not it's in a, in a college kid who's confused and in turmoil on the inside of their life, or whether it's all out evil that's being proclaimed out there as something good. And, and, and they do that. I was reading um, a, a piece on the, the vice president and, in the newspaper, and the journalist who was writing it is like, isn't this guy crazy? 
he brings his wife with him when he's meeting with other women. Old-fashioned, crazy, archaic. They, they were just basically picking him apart because he's trying to live a pure life that is above temptation. So he brings his wife with him if he has to go out and meet with another woman alone. He doesn't allow that to come in. And they're saying, that's crazy today. Well, that's, that's wise today. That's wise. But our world has turned stuff upside down. And that's why we are light in darkness and salt in a world that has lost its taste. You need to follow Jesus. He is your captain. And we work with him in his mission to prevail against evil. So we know who the captain is. We know what the mission is. We're in his mission. And what are the means? And, and this is the last verse here in this whole thing. It says, Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. He says this. Now, he's still addressing Peter. He says, Peter, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, you know what keys are. I have keys here. Keys are not only those things that really make it feel uncomfortable when you sit down. I know, ladies, you don't have that problem. You have a purse. If you can keep them in your purse. Every now and then we find keys around here. Either they've fallen out of men's pockets or, or they've been uh, fallen out of a purse. A lot of guys, they take them out and they sit them down beside them because they don't want to sit on them and they forget that they're there. But what do keys do? Well, this one gives me access to my front door. It lets me in. It opens doors. This one opens my office door. This one opens the church door. This one opens the church office door. And this one gives me access to my vehicle. See, keys open doors. And so Peter here represents everyone in the church, everyone who follows Jesus as his or her captain, has keys to open doors. That's what Jesus says. Peter was the first to believe Christ, that Jesus was the Christ, and Peter opened door. He was the first one to take a key on the day of Pentecost, put it in the lock, open the door, and invite 3,000 people to come in to know Jesus Christ. He is the keys. But just not just Peter that has the keys. You and I also have the keys to the kingdom that through our influence, we open the door. We open the door to people in our families. We open the door for people in our workplaces, for our circle of friends to know and experience what we've experienced in a relationship with Jesus Christ to follow Jesus as our captain. You have the key. There's times I've sat with families who have gone through times of bereavement and times of huge life change, and I've said to them, you know what? You're the key. You're the key. And I say to every one of you, in somebody's life today, you are the key to the kingdom. You understand what I'm saying? Actually, I'm not saying it. Jesus said it. You're the key through your influence, through your life. You open a door for them. And this whole idea of binding and loosing refers to your influence. You either open or close those things that will bring them into fellowship with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 18... Jesus talks about this further, about the key. And he talks to all of his disciples, and he says, you have a key, and anybody, anybody who follows me and goes to a person who they know and restores that person to faith, opens the door, has the key of the kingdom, and opens the door and binds and looses the things in their life that will bring them closer to God. That's the power that you and I have. That Christ has given you in the kingdom. This is what you have. We have the keys of the kingdom in our job to open the door, to encourage people to come as they are. Jesus has given every one of us a job description 
and a key to the door to open it for others. How do we open that door around here? We open it through love. Through love. We open the door through loving and accepting other people. Whoever, whatever. We love them. We accept them. Through teaching them and telling them about Jesus Christ. That's why we have all over the church. Love, teach, and reach. Because we open that door with the keys to the kingdom of our influence to teach them about love. To teach them about God and the gospel and that Jesus loves them and receives them and then to reach out to them to reach out to them wherever they are at any time wherever the need is and that's why we give you these cards to just it's a way of reaching out and saying why don't you come why don't you come you don't know that could be the key that changes not just one person's life but their whole family it's a simple little thing like an invite the other place where Jesus uses this word, and same in Matthew 18, not only is it when we restore somebody to their relationship with God, but also when we pray. When we pray. Prayer is one of the most powerful keys in turning things around in people's lives. And that's why we say to you, begin to pray now for those people. Because prayer is a key to the kingdom that turns the lock on an old rusty door and can swing those hinges open where nothing else could. And Jesus teaches us that through prayer, we can bind and we can loose those things in the kingdom that will bring people closer to Jesus. The purpose of my life and your life is this, to follow the master, to prevail against evil and the enemy, and to work with God in establishing his kingdom. I have on the back of the communication card. We're going to collect them in a moment. You can fill them out. I'm going to use my life to build Jesus' kingdom. I'm going to take, I'm going to follow the captain. I'm going to join him in his mission. And I'm going to take the key that he's given me. I'm going to use it to unlock the doors. To unlock the doors. And to let people in. To invite people in. That's what Christ is talking about in this verse. All theologians look at it and they argue about all sorts of things in the verse, but I don't think Jesus wanted us sitting around arguing about it. I think he wants us just doing it. Just do it. Just do it. So let's just bow our heads this morning. If you're still filling out your card, just, just fill it out. With our heads bowed. Maybe you're looking at that saying, well, what, am I really going to do that? Or should I tick it off or should I not? I guess it determines on what ship you're sailing in. There are many good people. I, I want to say this. There are many good people that are sailing on the cruise ship. They love Jesus. Don't get me wrong. They love Jesus. They've been taught all their life that it's all about them and meeting their needs. That Jesus wants to make them happy. And that's what they've come to believe following Jesus is. And they're good, they're, they're good Christian people. God loves them. They're just not building the kingdom. They're not working with the Savior and what he's doing. They're not on the mission. They're not using the key. And I, I'm calling you to be different. To see yourselves as a part of Jesus' army that recognizes him as captain who has a mission to build his church and establish his kingdom. A captain who's coming again. A captain who's working right now in this world that this world isn't going to hell in a handbasket but God is working and he's holding back and he's not impatient but he's wanting for every person to have an opportunity to come and to know Jesus and we're a part of that army that has the key that goes out 
And through every means possible, we open the door and invite people in. That's what I'm asking you to join up for today. Or maybe this morning you need to recognize and ask that question in your own life. Who is Jesus? And this morning you'd like to say, Jesus is my Lord, my captain, my master. That's the first step. There's no stowaways on a battleship. <laughs> Cruise ships, oh yeah, all kinds. Come on and eat. Experience. Experience it all before you pay for the trip. They don't, they don't sneak on battleships. They try to sneak out of them, not on them. And you can't stow away on Christ's kingdom. You have to come to him. And God is drawing you. And so in your very heart, just say, Lord, yeah, okay. I'm going to serve you as my captain, my master, my, my king, my Lord. Just say that in your life. Ask him to forgive your sins and just to help you every day. Put it together. He will. He did for me. He will for you. Thank you, Lord. Father, for those who are praying for three people, Lord, we bring those people to you again and just mention them under your breath this morning. Their names. Lord, we pray as they receive their invitations that they'll come. Lord, help us to turn the lock on their door and to open it up and invite them to come as they are to hear the truth of your word. In Jesus' name. And maybe there's something God has called you to do, to use the predicament you're in, to use the testimony you have, to use the gift that you've been given the time that you have to help build his kingdom. Start doing it today. Make a decision to say, yeah, I'm going to get back doing what I'm supposed to be doing to serve him. Father, just bless your church, I pray. Bless your people as they serve you. In Jesus' name. Lord, we're on a battleship. We're in your army, Lord. We're following you. We're building your church through love, through reaching out, through teaching and telling others about Christ. Amen. Stand with me. I'm going to ask if you could pass your cards to your right, my left, as we prepare ourselves to leave. There's a song that's being played and step by step, God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you, and I'll follow you step by step. That's what I'm preaching about this morning. Let's sing it together as we go. Oh, God, you are my God. you to sail on out of here down to the coffee shop and enjoy a cup of coffee something to eat and uh, there's a draw down there to see who helps to uh, chop off Dwayne's beard God bless you have a wonderful wonderful day